Hi, I'm James McDonald. Welcome back to our weekly teaching here. And uh, we're having a great time ministering to men. We're almost into our uh, summer series uh, here at Rock Bottom. And uh, we now have more than 40 men uh, under our roof every night. Pray for us as we minister to them and care for them. And uh, we gather on Saturday nights for what's called uh, the best meeting of the week. And uh, it is the best meeting of the week. And some of our friends from outside of um, the Act Like Men houses come and join us. And uh, we just have a wonderful, wonderful time in God's Word and in worship. And then we share a meal together afterwards. And uh, so pray for us if you think of us. And uh, I'm going to start recording brand new teaching that I've never done before. But right now we're coming. We've got two weeks left in the message of hope. Hope springs eternal from the book of 1 Thessalonians. And uh, today we're going to be looking at uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. This is the climax of the book. If this wasn't here, it would have been harder to find the theme of hope. And the title of this message is The Greatest Hope We Have. So the most concentrated teaching on hope in the New Testament is in 1 Thessalonians. And the most concentrated teaching in 1 Thessalonians on hope is right in front of us today. So if you've been dragging your uh, shoulders and drooping your knees and kind of um, just suffering along, man, I have been there when you really wonder if hope will return at all. Well, hope headed your way right now from God's word. In fact, let me just pray for you. God, I pray for that person who needs hope, especially who's had a hard week and a hard month or a hard year. I really do understand that. And I pray that your timeless word and this recording of its content would come with fresh power from the Holy Spirit and invigorate fresh hope in the heart of every hearer. Thank you, God, that you care about the condition of our souls. Thank you that your word does bring life and let it ignite fresh hope in us today, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. All right, 1 Thessalonians 4, let's go. Uh, 1 Thessalonians. Our series is Hope Springs Eternal, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, if you could make your way there. Uh, this message has one uh, main thought, the last paragraph in 1 Thessalonians 4. Here it is. Uh, Jesus Christ is coming again. Uh, the date and time are set, uh, though we don't know uh, exactly uh, when. Um, let me just say that the date and time are set, and it is absolutely sure this is very uh, plain in Scripture. Uh, Jesus Christ is coming again. Uh, the plan is in place. The facts are settled. The future is certain. Jesus Christ is coming again. Someday, I believe very soon, uh, someday, uh, in the twinkling of an eye, the sky will break open, the trumpet will sound, uh, the uh, dead in Christ will rise first, the voice of the archangel will be heard, and Jesus Christ uh, will appear. Every wrong will be righted for his children, and uh, we will reign with him forever. All of that, in a moment, every reality will be changed forever. Uh, Jesus Christ is coming again. Let me say it again so you'll have no doubt what this message is about. Uh, Jesus Christ is coming again. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. Let me read the paragraph that is our spiritual food at church this morning. Um, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others who do not have hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound 
of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Now, the goal of the message this morning, plain and simple, is to take the truth of the return of Christ and to encourage you with it. You don't have to uh, wonder why that's here. Uh, the goal would be that I would encourage you and then that you would leave here and encourage one another and others with these words. Turn to your neighbor and say, this is going to be encouraging. <laughs> All right. It's going to be encouraging today. That's uh, the goal that we're going for. The title of the message is the greatest hope we have. The greatest hope we have. Jesus Christ coming again. Make a note of it. Jesus Christ coming again is the greatest hope of every Christian. If you could get a good Christian, a healthy Christian, a strong Christian, a committed Christian, and you could autopsy their soul, you would diagnose that more than their thoughts about this year, more than their thoughts about the next decade, more than their thoughts about anything really, their greatest hope is that Jesus Christ is coming again. This is the great hope of the church. This is the great hope of every Christ follower. So... Why are so many Christians sad? Why are so many Christians sullen? Why are so many Christians filled with fear and even dread as they think about the future? It's because they don't have at their core a full faith grasp of this reality. It's the greatest hope we have. Jesus Christ is coming again. Now let's work on it a bit. Start here. You have to understand it. You have to understand it. A lot of people uh, actually don't even understand it. And the truth of the rapture, uh, Christ uh, returning and reclaiming all Christians from earth before the wrath of God descends during the tribulation time, during the last days, you have to understand this. Look up here for a sec. A hope isn't magic. I'm not going to do a trick this morning. A hope isn't uh, a motivational speech. Hope isn't, God help us, a preacher pep talk that doesn't affect your soul beyond Sunday afternoon. It's not that. This is actual bedrock reality. In fact, hope is heart reality anchored to the rock of God's word. So what I'm going to show you is written by the spirit of God in the word of God. It is the creator of the universe's declaration about what is a certain future for every follower of Jesus Christ. And you have to understand it. That's why he says here, we do not want you to be uninformed brothers. 1 Thessalonians 4.13. Paul actually uses that formula multiple times. He uses it twice in Romans, twice in 1 Corinthians. He uses it in Philippians and Colossians. It's a good problem to solve for people of faith. The problem is you just don't know. Now, the term that he uses here is the word from which we get our word agnostic. So he's not saying that you know it and don't believe it. He's saying there's a lot of people, even Christians, that don't really understand that Jesus Christ is coming again. Now, skeptics will say, oh, Christians have been saying that for 2,000 years. Well, they were saying that the Messiah would come for more than 4,000 years. And he came. Didn't, he, didn't, didn't Jesus? That was a great spot for an amen. Hang on, hang on, hang on. I could use a little piece of um, stuff to fall out of the rafters right now. A little, little Easter truth for your hearts. Uh, Jesus did come the first time, right? Amen. And he's coming again. Amen. I don't want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who have fallen asleep. Frequently in the scriptures, sleep is euphemistic for death. 
Someone say, give me an example. Okay, I got one actually. There's a lot of them. In John chapter 11, Lazarus had died and Jesus didn't rush to his bedside when he was sick, so he died. Then three days later in John 11, Jesus says, come on, let's go to Lazarus so that we can wake him up. The disciples are like, wake him up? If he's just sleeping, he can wake up himself. And it says in John 11, then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. He'd use the term sleep. We do the same thing. We soften things and no one likes to say he's dead. So he said he's sleeping. Now the idea of Christians who have passed actually sleeping and not being dead is one of our great traditions. That's why we don't burn the body like pagans do. And if you didn't know that, God can certainly gather the cinder fragments of a Christian wrongly prepared for what we're talking about right here. But we bury the body in hope. Only Christianity buries the body in hope of the resurrection that's coming. And that does matter. Now, we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are dead. That you may not grieve as others who do not have hope. Now, the others that he was talking about were other people living in Thessalonica. I've showed you before the picture of Thessalonica there at the base of Mount Olympus, the ground zero of polytheism in the first century. The Egyptians had their many gods, Isis, Serapis. The Greeks had their pantheon of Zeus and Apollo and Aphrodite and Diana and on and on. All popular, all impotent, as false gods always are. Followed but never felt by the followers because they are just the figment of imagination. And when Paul got to Thessalonica and proclaimed the living Christ, this changed it for everyone, but he was taken away so suddenly they were still stuck with their pagan views of what happened to people when they die. The two main groups were, the first of all, the Stoics, the Stoics taught that the soul is swallowed up by a fiery substance which is identical to deity. In other words, that when you die, you're subsumed into the furnace that is God. Stoics believe that the body was evil. The Epicureans, on the other hand, the other extreme, uh, believe that a pleasure, in, in effect, was God, much like our culture today. And the Epicureans believed as long as we are alive, death does not exist. When death appears, quote, uh, we no longer exist. And so they had a just when you die, that's it. There's nothing else. So you better eat, drink and be merry. Right. And that's much like the, uh, the world that we're in today. Get while you can, because there's when it's all done, the getting's over. And uh, but neither, neither the Stoics nor the Epicureans believed in a life after death. And because Paul was taken away suddenly, the people were like, what the heck? Where's my mom? What, what, what about my sister? What, what's going to happen to these people that have died? And of course, they had been told, Jesus Christ is coming again. And they were pretty excited about it. But like, well, my sister, she died. What's going to happen to her? And that's why we have what we have right here. With that in your mind, let's read it again. We don't want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are dead, that you may not grieve as others who do not have hope. There's our word, hope. So there is a grieving. How many people here have uh, loved ones uh, that are in eternity? Come on. And, and, and how many have loved ones that are in eternity and, and they're with the Lord? And, and what's going to happen to them? And am I going to see them again? And how's all this going to play out? The questions are obvious and understandable. Well, um, he says it's okay to grieve, but you can't grieve like these people who have no hope. The, the polytheists of Thessalonica, in fact, if you've ever had to read Homer's Iliad in school, um, if you have, I'm deeply sorry that you had to go through that. <laughs> but the, the close of Homer's Iliad, one of the most ancient pieces of literature existing in the world today, 
it closes with really a, a death and funeral a processional for a guy named Hector and the darkness of it and the weeping and the wailing and the cutting themselves because they, they see those without Christ see only a hopeless end. But we as the followers of Christ see an endless hope. Do you see the difference? And so they wanted to understand that better. And this is why we have the paragraph uh, that we have here. Now, let me just say that uh, grieving uh, for Christians is good. And he doesn't say here, don't grieve. And when people leave us and we face the prospect of the remainder of life without them, we grieve. We, uh, the word is lupeo, we feel soul pain or anguish about the loss. And he says, grieving, grieving is great. But we don't grieve like people who have no hope. Sometimes, though, Christians do sadly grieve in a hopeless way. And what it reveals is, is that our hope is not placed in the right thing. Sometimes it seems that we are instead grieving because life is not working out the way that we planned and the death of a loved one means, man, I can't have it the way that I planned for it to be. But well, let me just use as an example something that we went through that taught this to us pretty early on, Kathy and I, in our marriage. Uh, Kathy, as I've uh, taught before, um, comes from a family of non-believers. She was very, her parents were divorced when she was just uh, a, a toddler. And, uh, but she was very, very close to her father growing up uh, and her mother. But here's a picture of Kathy with her dad when she was a little uh, girl. And uh, they were just so close. When I met her, he was the central figure in her life by quite a bit. And she'd never been to church in her life, never opened a Bible, not one time until she was 15 years old. And her dad thought, well, I'm going to get some religion into your life. And he took her. He didn't have any idea what he bargained for. <laughs> and he brought her to a church, and she found Christ. And her life was changed completely. And uh, after a period of a number of months, she and I started a date. We fell in love. We got married. And he didn't take all this very well. And uh, I don't want to say anything even to embarrass uh, his memory. But he just didn't handle it well. But as we got into our marriage and then moved to the States here, things warmed and he came and visited us here. And you know, even in the last weeks of his life, we had an incredible opportunity. I sat down and shared the whole gospel with him and he listened uh, tenderly, if not tearfully, and heard every single word. But I didn't get to learn of his response because about three weeks later, I was in Denver working on my doctoral studies. This was 1990. And we got the phone call that you don't want to get, and her father, just 47 years old, that seems pretty young to me now. Her father, 47 years old, um, had been drinking, and he fell off of a roof in a construction accident and was killed. And uh, let me just tell you something. Staying focused on hope and life not the way you planned it and being uncertain of where that person is in eternity. Well, I thought the best way to kind of give you a sense of how we wrestled with that. Here's a little uh, video we made 12 or 13 years ago with Kathy talking about it. When we got home, there was a lot of questions and just a lot of, um, a lot of crying, a lot of tears, a lot of wondering, a lot of doubt, a lot of fear, just really, um, where was my dad in his relationship with the Lord? And, um, I remember we're having a lot of talks of, you know, maybe, maybe, um, I like the thief on the cross. Maybe he cried out to the mm -hmm. Lord in the last moments yes. of his life. And praise God, we do have that. The more the Lord has settled into our lives that last time with my dad. And so, um, you know, before the Lord, we can be thankful that we really did share the gospel and the good news. I remember just finally coming to the conclusion after I had worked all of these things through that um, if I really believed in the sovereignty of God, if I really believed everything that, um, you know, the Bible says and that God stands for, that he knows what's best. And, um, you know, he loves, 
he was the one who created my dad. He was the one who knew what was best for him. And even though it's hard for, in my finite mind, um, I, I really came to the place, and James knows, um, with fear and trembling, that I could trust the Lord and I could really honestly say that I believed that God knew best and um, that God was the judge of this whole earth and of all of its inhabitants and um, that I had to, for, for the rest of my walk with the Lord, that I had to be okay with that. It's still hurt. It's still it's confusing, but every time I even go, sometimes I would say to James later, I should be really upset about this, I but every that. time I go to, before the Lord when I'm feeling overwhelmed, the Lord just gives me an unbelievable sense of he's in control and I can trust him. Mm -hmm. And praise God, because since then we've had a lot of other things that have mm -hmm. been difficult to trust the Lord for. So here's the thing. What is the thing in your life that you hold on to, that you want to control, that you want to dictate, that you want to say, for me to have hope, it has to be like this. What's the thing that you need to, like we had to, that you need to say, no, I'm going to trust God with that, and I'm going to place my hope and trust where the Bible trust tells me to place it. Jesus Christ is coming again. Now, if a person is hanging on to this, they're like, well, I hope he doesn't come at the wrong time. I hope he doesn't come when my plans aren't complete. I hope he doesn't come when I don't have it the way I want it. But you lay all of that down. You take all of your eggs, as it were, and you put it in the, the biblical hope basket. Here it is. Jesus Christ is coming again. The skies are going to break open. He's going to return. Every question is going to be answered. Every wrong is going to be righted. And we're going to reign with him for all of eternity. Put your hope there. Right there. I'm not in charge. I'm not in control. I don't dictate what's happening. He's in control. Amen. He's in control. Jesus Christ is Lord. That's all that I need. That's all that I need. You can... Have this world. You can have it. That's fun to say that. Come on, say it. You can have it. Come on, say it like a preacher. You can, have it. you can have it. You can have this world. Just give me, say it. Jesus. Just give me Jesus. And that's where hope is found. Now, lead your family, love your family, pray and work for every single member of your family to be saved. But here it is. Remember whose you are and do not put your hope at risk for anyone. I can't be hopeful till my sister, I can't be hopeful till my son, I can't be hopeful till, stop it, stop it. There's a God who rules the universe. I tried to show you this isn't some platitude. We've been through some deep water to get to this place, we've had to let go of some things that were hard to let go of, to take hold of an unshakable hope. And I want you to join me here. Jesus Christ is coming again. This is the greatest hope of every Christian. Yes, we grieve, but not like people who don't have hope. You say, how do I maintain this hope? Look at verse 14. For since we believe, there it is, we believe. Underline that in your neighbor's Bible, will you? <laughs> we believe. That's the second thing. Jesus Christ coming again is the greatest hope of every Christian. Understand it, believe it. Believe it. It's not yours until your faith is exercised toward it. I, uh, in front of our house, where we live, there's a big, tall uh, shagbark hickory tree. And uh, I uh, have inherited my grandmother's love of trees. I confess to a preoccupation with trees and leaves and how they come out. And there had been some digging around the area where this beautiful, uh, majestic tree is. And I was so concerned that this tree was going to die. And wouldn't you know it, I didn't realize this till I talked to a friend of mine who knows these things, but apparently the shagbark hickory tree's leaves come out 
like at the end. So, I mean, every oak tree, every maple tree, they all had their leaves. And this thing was like, I had to get out my binoculars and I would look up and, oh, there's some buds there. There's some buds there. And my wife's like, what are you doing? I'm looking at the tree again. And, and, and the problem is, is even when you see a little bit of activity out on the ends of the branches, you don't know how much life is inside that thing. Here you are at church again. And it's so good to see those of you that I can see, and by faith I can see all of you. Your Bibles are open, and you're leaning forward into the Word of God. I love that about you. But I really can't say very much about you by what I see. It's what's inside that counts. And that's where faith resides. And I can preach on hope till I'm hoarse. And, I, and I'm doing it. <laughs> but if there's not faith in your heart, embracing it as your anchoring reality, you won't live like our Father wants us to live. Confident expectation of better things ahead. Why? Because I know how it ends. Amen. Jesus Christ is coming back. He's going to put everything as it should be. Every wrong will be righted. Every injustice will be put in place. Everything that my heart has longed to know will be answered for me. And we will rejoice and reign with him through all of eternity. That's something, that's a rock you can stand on. That's the centerpiece of hope. And that's why his reasoning here, he's like, think about it. Since we believe Jesus died and rose again, Amen. need that confetti to fall again? <laughs> Love you. Since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, Amen. even so through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have, if Jesus Christ conquered sin and death to offer salvation freely to all who believe, turn to your neighbor and say, and he did. <laughs> if Jesus Christ conquered sin and death to offer salvation freely to all of those who believe, do you think that God will then abandon those that he has saved in the end? Surely not. Since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare by a word from the Lord. You don't see that very often in Scripture. So that's Scripture declaring itself to be Scripture. The Holy Spirit is inspiring Paul to say that the Holy Spirit is inspiring Paul. It's like a double punctuation, two exclamation points. You're holding the word, and in the word, the word is telling you that this word is the word from God. Got it? This must be fairly important. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord. I hope that's us. I really hope that's us. How many people could take a total pass on the whole death experience? I will not be in heaven going, bummer, we didn't get to die. Everybody with me on that? Right, so, so I really am really saying, Lord, it'd be super awesome if we could be that group. But either way, his grace is sufficient, amen? That we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. The Thessalonians were concerned because they're like, man, you told us about this parade. And, and, and we, you told us Jesus was coming back and all that. And, and, but what about the people who died? And he's like, yeah, they're, 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 they're going to already be in the parade when you join it. You're going to come like walking into the parade and I'm going to be like, hey, mom, isn't this awesome? Just like the Bible says. It's like, this is awesome. Pay attention. <laughs> You know, because you're not going to want to blow this, right? Like march in formation, here we come. And, and we are going to be caught up together with the Lord in the air. 
how awesome that will be. That is our hope. Note this, hope is not a wistful wishing for an unlikely or an improbable future. It's not that, not at all. And we can say, you know, the Cubs might do it this year. It, it, it might happen. You know, we can say, you know, I'm trying to lose a few pounds. It's going good so far. It could. That's not hope. That's not hope. Hope is the confident expectation of something better ahead. Now, so how, how, do, I, how do I get that confidence? Well, the confidence is born of experience. And we would not expect that a baby Christian would have the same kind of hope that a person who's been following the Lord uh, for a long time would have. I said to Kathy Friday morning, I'm really looking forward uh, to summer like I haven't for a few years. And I, I'm really looking forward to barbecues. How many people are a fan of barbecues? Now, how do, how, do you, how do you know that barbecues are good? You've had many of them. He says, I've had many of them. Yes, yes, we have. My uh, dad is coming down. That's another thing I'm looking forward to. My dad's coming down this week. And, and uh, he's coming with his wife. <laughs> right around their first year anniversary. And they haven't been here since they got married. And, and uh, so he'll be in church next week. And y'all be on your best behavior. <laughs> and and you say, well, how do you know he's coming? He told me he was. And it's this month, June of 1986, 30 years ago, we moved here. I think my dad's probably driven down here, I bet, a hundred times in all that time. Every single time he came the day he said he was going to come. Every single time he left when he said he was going to leave. So over time, you build confidence. I know barbecues are good. I know when my dad's coming. And that's how you build confidence in the Word of God. You know, God, I wrote a whole book on this called Always True, that God has made all these promises to us. And when you're a baby Christian, you're like, well, that's what it says. I mean, it'd be awesome if that was true. But when you've known the Lord, like Peter, they become exceedingly great and precious promises because you put your full weight down on them. And I have never been disappointed with his faithfulness to do what he says he will do. Sometimes I wish he'd, amen. Sometimes I wish he'd do it sooner, but afterwards I always find out his timing was best. Sometimes I wish he'd do it different, but always afterwards I find out that his ways are best. In fact, here's a little secret verse, little secret verse. I got some good little ones. Jeremiah 1.12. You know what it says? Here, let me put it up in front of all of you. You don't even have to turn there, but make a note of the reference. Jeremiah 1.12. Then the Lord said... I am watching over my word to perform it. Isn't that great? Don't you think God knows what he said in his word? Don't you think he knows the promises he made? Don't you think he knows that he said his son is coming again? And what are the chances that the God who spoke and the worlds were formed isn't going to make sure that everything he said happens? Whether I see it or don't, whether I feel it or don't, God today, today, Junior, today, God is watching over his word to perform it. So Jesus Christ is coming again. You have to understand it and you have to believe it. Faith comes by hearing the word of God. Uh, confidence is built through the experience of putting your weight down on these realities and finding that they sustain you. Then this. Understand it. Believe it. Look for it. We're supposed to be looking for. The Bible says we're supposed to be looking for it. Everyone look up. Look up. We're look up. We're supposed to be looking for it. Now, you can't look for something you don't recognize. If you don't know what the coming of Christ looks like, how can you be looking expectantly, hopefully? So jot these down, six quick rapture facts. All coming right out of the text, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16. Here's the first one. 
Savior. See it there? For the Lord himself will descend from heaven. The Lord himself. Nothing delegated here. Not, hey, angels, go get my kids. No, no, no. Not, um, send the saints, send the elders around the throne. No, no. I, I don't think we could complain if he assigned this task to someone. Agreed? He's like, no, 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 hang on, hang on. He gets up off the throne. I'm doing this myself. So we're looking for Jesus Christ. All right, that's the first thing. Savior, then this, uh, sky. That's why I had you look up. Notice the Lord himself will descend from heaven. In verse 17, it uses the word clouds. Revelation chapter 1 verse 7 says, Behold, he is coming, and every eye will see him. He's coming on the clouds. Every eye will see him. I was reminded, and I turned quickly as I was studying to Acts chapter 1. Do you remember the ascension of Christ in Acts chapter 1? And all the disciples were around, and then the, the clouds opened, and Jesus was rising up into heaven, and then the clouds closed around him. And the disciples were like, what the heck, man? And, and, and the disciples, and they're like, and the angels appeared and said, men of Galilee, why do you stand here gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, whom you have seen go, will come again in the same manner. So just like he went up and the clouds closed and veiled our sight of him, so someday, I believe soon, the clouds are going to break open and every eye will see him and Jesus Christ is going to return. How awesome will that be? Yeah. Yeah. Note this. Sudden. It's going to be sudden. 1 Thessalonians 4 says, With the cry of command. With a cry of command. What will the command be? Let's go! Do it now! Well, I don't know what it's going to say, but it's going to be a loud uh, cry of command, save your sky, sudden sound. With a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, several places, including Jude, uh, mention these archangels, these ruling highest angels. A cry of command, the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. Now, I played the trombone uh, in the band. Uh, in high school. Apparently, there's not going to be a trombone as part of this. I feel kind of disappointed, really. Um, no clarinets. Not with, thank God. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, no French horns, no tubas, no guitars. Oh, the greatest trumpet player I know is sitting right here. It's going to be a trumpet. You must feel pretty good about that today. That's your whole career, right, Carrie? That's really awesome. And, and I, don't, I don't, you could, you know, I, the Bible doesn't say what, uh, what instruments God likes best, but I think it's fair to say that he probably picked this. Would you agree? I doubt if they're like, yeah, try that. I bet he'll like that. No, it's not going to be like that. This is exactly the way he wants it. And what he wants is he wants a trumpet. It's interesting that uh, a trumpet is always the instrument chosen to sound the alarm to rally the troops. This isn't going to be any message of retreat, let me tell you. This is going to be charge! And Jesus Christ is coming back for his children. How awesome sound. And then notice, this is going to be social. I love this. The trumpet of God, the dead in Christ will rise first. My mother, my grandmother... The dead in Christ will rise first. How awesome that is. And then notice, then we who are alive and are left will be caught up together with them. Talk about a nice merge. 
right? And when you think about being reunited with your loved ones, if you live until the day Christ returns, this is the reunion right there. Together, together. Notice it, see it in the text? We, together, with them, all together, to meet the Lord in the air. But notice it's only those in Christ, the dead in Christ, those who are alive and remain in Christ. Kathy and I were in New York City last week and we were walking along and... We saw this big cemetery. This is Calvary Cemetery in Queens, New York. Three million burials there. And all the stones look the same. But sadly we know that broad is the road that leads to destruction and many people are going that way. And narrow is the road that leads to eternal life. And only a few are finding it. But some of those stones, surely some of the ones you can see, are so different than all the others. Because buried there in hope are those who died in Christ. This is the defining reality of the human race. He who has the Son has life, John says. And he who does not have the Son of God does not have life. There's no in the middle. There's no on the fence. There's just one or the other. And if you haven't turned from your sin and embraced Christ by faith, do it today. This might be the day, the last day. And then the opportunity is gone. Well, finally... Settled. Savior sky, sudden sound, social, settled. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So we will always be with the Lord. Think about that. Talk about a changing reality. How's your day going? Awesome. <laughs> I said in other sermons, have a good day will be a stupid thing to say in heaven. Are you new here or what? <laughs> right? Every day we're going to be with Jesus Christ. Forever. Uh, we will not ever get over the nearness of God. Now, you know, with us by his spirit, across the crystal sea, on the throne. But in heaven, Jesus is moving into the neighborhood. He owns the house up the street. And that changes everything. And listen, and it's what he wants. It's what he wants. He wants today, trust me. He is wanting, he is longing to be with his children. Speaking of children, this is uh, Landon and Bree's little boy, Ezra. Did I mention that his middle name was James? <laughs> and Ezra um, has absolutely changed our second son, Landon, and his wife's life. He's going to turn... Uh, he's going to turn uh, one uh, in July. And I'll tell you, he has changed Landon and Bray in one year. Just changed them. And now, like they were out to see us on Friday night. And it's all about this kid. And where is he? And how is he doing? And is he sleeping? And what does he need? And, and you know this. And they never went to any seminar on this. Like you, there's no love your kids seminar. People who don't love their kids are sick, right? <laughs> True or false? <laughs> I mean, you, you love them when they hate you. You can't, you, true or false? You love them and nobody has to teach you this. Now look at, God has revealed his affection for his own by calling us children. John 1.12 says, as many as have received him to those he's given the authority to be called children of God. 1 John 3, 1 says, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we would be called the children of God. Now you've got to understand this. Jesus is not busy. He is not distracted. He is not elsewhere. He is longing for this reunion in a way that we can't begin to understand. As only a parent longs for their own child. In John 14, he said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe in me. 
In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. Why, Jesus? That where I am, there you may be also. This is what he wants. Like every parent longs for their child. Jesus Christ is longing for his own today. And if you are one of his sons and daughters, because you've turned from your sin and embraced Christ by faith, this is your future. This is your hope. This is your reality. Therefore, verse 18, encourage one another with these words. How's it going? Is it going okay? Are we encouraging each other? Yes. This, therefore, the word encourage there uh, actually is parakletos. It's the word from which we get um, uh, in, in John 14. It's the picture of the Holy Spirit. A parakletos is one who comes to the side. Not one who's like, you need to hear this. <laughs> okay? Not like that. All right? And not, not like someone who's talking, you need to hear this. Okay? It's not like that. It's like someone who comes to the side and says, come on, let's work on this together. Okay? <laughs> I don't know if he's buying it or not. <laughs> That's what encouragement is. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Words matter. I'm going to give you a final word. We're pretty strong at amen. We hear a lot of amens in church. We're... Occasionally strong at hallelujah, which means uh, praise the Lord. We sing sometimes hosanna, which means Lord save us. But 1 Corinthians 16, 22 talks about a word that we, I want to add this to the harvest vocabulary. It's right out of the Bible. The word is maranatha. Maranatha means come Lord. Come Lord Jesus. We need you so desperately. The world is growing darker by the day. And the light of your presence is so desperately needed. Maranatha. And God forgive us for all the times that we try to comfort one another with descriptions of a better tomorrow. Well, you'll find a job. Well, you'll, 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 you'll get that worked out. Well, that, that'll, that'll turn around and, and, and you know, you'll get a little healthier and, and, and all of the, what they call rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. This is all going to burn. God, give us hope where it's really found. Hope in our future. Hope in our Savior. Hope in our bedrock reality that Jesus Christ He's coming again. It's going to be great, right? Everybody say, this world is not my home. Come on, lift up your voice and say it. Say, this world is not my home. All right? That's where we got to be. That's where our hope is anchored. Jesus Christ is coming again. This world is not my home. Say it again.